Welcome to our second video series on systematic reviews and meta-analyses. I'm Laura Cavaroli, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. In this video series, I will be guiding you through an exercise where we're going to be applying our knowledge of SRMAs to the critical review of one. My only disclosure is that I am currently a MyTax Elevate postdoctoral fellow jointly funded by the Government of Canada and the Canadian Sugar Institute. In the first series of videos, we discussed the value and purpose of SRMAs and reviewed the important steps in their conduct, which hopefully helped increase your understanding of how to interpret as well as how to criticize them. This series of videos will be a guided exercise. We will walk through an example of critically assessing a SRMA and at the end, we will assess our overall confidence in the results by reviewing and performing a grade assessment. I encourage you to select a SRMA of interest to you to apply in the steps I will guide you through in reading and critically assessing SRMAs. By using your own selected SRMA, it will make this exercise more applicable to your work or interests. Please do not choose a network SRMA for this exercise as I will not be covering this type of SRMA. I recommend that you have a quick read over the SRMA you would like to use, so you're a bit familiar with it before engaging in this exercise. However, you can follow along with my example, which I will introduce to you in the next slide and which you can find on the Canadian Sugar Institute website under the links to the videos for this series. Just a note when referring to the Canadian Sugar Institute website later on, I may use CSI as an abbreviation, so just bear that in mind. Please remember you will need the online supplement or appendix, whether you, you, you are using your own selected SRMA or my example as it contains important information. As we walk through our critical analysis, I will ask you to look for things in your SRMA. So I recommend you use the control F function to quickly search for keywords in your PDFs. I have also created a very basic worksheet depicted here, which again you can find on the Canadian Sugar Institute website under the links to the videos for this series. This worksheet may help you follow along with my questions and give you a place to make some notes if you wish. The questions I pose to you throughout these videos, which are noted in the worksheet, will help you in the final video when we perform the rough grade assessment of your SRMA to assess the certainty of evidence presented. You will see this image appear periodically throughout the videos, which will coincide with when I refer you to completing a question in the worksheet. You may wish to pause the video when you see this image and then take a minute to answer the question indicated. Here is the SRMA I will be using as an example in this exercise to walk through the steps of critically assessing a SRMA. It is entitled, Food Sources of Fructose-Containing Sugars and Glycemic Control, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Controlled Intervention Studies, and was published in the British Medical Journal in 2018. The focus of this SRMA is on exploring the effect of different food sources of fructose-containing sugars on hemoglobin A1c and other markers of glycemic control. This SRMA included studies which are controlled intervention studies, thus in line with the previous series of videos on SRMAs. I will be focusing on aspects of SRMAs conducted on trials as opposed to observational studies. So it may be easier for you to follow along if the SRMA you choose as your example to critically read and assess is also of trials. However, if yours is on observational studies, I will try to include comments throughout these videos which address any differences in what to look for. Again, a reminder to also have the online supplement or appendix to your SRMA open as you walk through this exercise with me as it contains important information you will need to review. Recall that it is important to understand that a systematic review and meta-analysis 
are actually two separate things. Generally, one is the identification of studies and one is a statistical technique. A study may not perform both. So it is important to take a look at your SRMA to see what was actually done. So take a look at your SRMA and please assess whether your SRMA includes both a systematic review and a meta-analysis. So answer yes, A, if it is both, B, if it is only a systematic review, C, if it is only a meta-analysis without a systematic review, and D, if you are not sure. If you answered B or D, you likely will not be able to perform the grade assessment in part three of this video series. In this case, you can choose another SRMA now or follow along with my example. Remember that systematic reviews and meta-analyses have the potential to provide the best evidence for efficacy, safety, and or effectiveness in nutritional sciences research. That is when limitations and heterogeneity are appropriately acknowledged and handled. Before we dive into reviewing our SRMAs, I want to bring your attention back to the last concept I mentioned in the previous video, which is the evaluation of how confident we are in the overall conclusions drawn in a SRMA. One method which can be used to assess our certainty of evidence is GRADE, which stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. Many international organizations have provided input into the development of the GRADE approach, which is now considered the standard in guideline development. I want to briefly explain how to apply GRADE to a SRMA so you can have key things in mind as we assess our SRMAs and then attempt to perform, perform an approximate of a GRADE assessment in part three of this video series. There are a large collection of papers published which explain how to assess each aspect of the GRADE approach. This is to demonstrate that it can be quite complex, but I will do my best to help guide you along the process. GRADE is an assessment of the certainty of evidence, that is the extent to which we are confident that an estimate of the effect or association is correct. After assessing the evidence of the SRMA, you will give it a grade of either high, moderate, low, or very low, each of which has a definition. For example, a grade of high means that this research provides a very good indication of the likely effect. The likelihood that the effect will be substantially different from what the research found is low. However, a grade of low means that this research provides some indication of the likely effect. However, the likelihood that the effect will be substantially different from what the research found is high. The level you start at depends on the types of studies included in the SRMA. If the SRMA includes randomized controlled trials, it starts with a grade of high since they have the least bias whereas a SRMA, including observational studies, starts with a grade of low, since these studies have greater sources of bias. From that starting point, you then assess various factors to rate up or down. These include individual study limitations, which is the risk of bias assessment performed for each individual study to assess the quality of the included studies, inconsistency of results, which is the heterogeneity in the meta-analysis, indirectness of the evidence, which is considering whether the included studies can directly answer the research question, imprecision, in which we reflect on the overall estimate of the pooled effect and whether it is meaningful and publication bias. Then the three factors to rate up include a dose response gradient, which comes from dose response analyses, a large magnitude of effect in which you see how big the overall effect is, and confounding, 
The latter two here apply principally to cohort studies and even then are not commonly found, especially in SRMAs and nutrition. These are the key points I want you to keep in mind as we assess our SRMAs. I will highlight them for you as we walk through our assessment and ask you to take note of what you find in your SRMA. If you use the worksheet I will refer to um, and which is available on the Cadian Sugar Institute website under the links to the videos, this may help with our approximate grade assessment, which we'll perform in video three of this series. So let's start by going through the eight general steps I reviewed for the conduct of the systematic review. We will begin by looking through our example to identify what the research question was and what were the eligibility criteria for the included studies. This will define the generalizability of the conclusions that can be drawn from the analyses. Take a minute and look through your SRMA and try to get a sense of the research question. Check the objective. So in our example, the research question is, what is the effect of different food sources of fructose containing sugars on glycemic control at different levels of energy control. So they are interested in the effect of different foods when studies are stratified by level of energy control. Make a note in your worksheet for questions one to three to record the type of trials included in your SRMA, whether it includes both a systematic review and a meta-analysis and on the research question. Note for question one, you may have a SRMA that includes both a synthesis of observational studies and a synthesis of clinical trials. For the purposes of this exercise and worksheet, please select one synthesis to evaluate. Next, we want to get a sense of what types of studies were included. Most studies will not explicitly have the PCOTS framework outlined for you. However, from the description of the study selection, we can identify the information to complete it. Look through the study description in the methods of your SRMA and get a sense of the inclusion criteria. Please make some notes on how you would complete the PCOTS framework, responding to question four in the worksheet. So for my SRMA example, the population is all health backgrounds, meaning all studies, regardless of inclusion criteria for the population recruited. The intervention is studies looking at the effect of a fructose containing sugar with a specific interest in food sources. The comparator is no or low fructose control. The outcomes of interest are glycemic control, including hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, and insulin. The time is a minimum follow-up of seven days duration of the intervention. And the study design is controlled intervention studies, which are either randomized or non-randomized. One more important part of the research question from the SRMA I am using is that they pre-specified that they will conduct separate analyses by study design based on level of energy control. So they are categorizing the eligible studies as either substitution studies where energy is matched between the prescribed intervention and control, addition studies where excess energy from food sources of fructose containing sugars was added to the background diets compared to the same background diet alone, as well as two other designs. However, I will only focus on the analysis of substitution studies where energy is matched between the intervention and control groups, and I will also only focus on the outcome of HbA1c in the interest of time. Check your SRMA to see if there is any additional separation of analyses that were performed. This is not common, so you may not find this in your SRMA. Also, if there are multiple outcomes reported in your SRMA, Take this time 
to select one of the outcomes which you want to assess the certainty of evidence for. Make a note of this uh, as the outcome under question three in your worksheet. And for each question I will ask you, record your answer with regards to this outcome. So you'll be assessing the certainty of the evidence for this outcome in video three uh, in this series. Now we want to check in the methods to see if they describe how they will address potential sources of heterogeneity, specifically if they mention the conduct of a priori subgroups. We reviewed heterogeneity in the previous videos, but we'll review it again briefly when we look at the results in the second video in this series. Look through the methods of your SRME to find whether or not they describe their a priori subgroup analyses and make a note under question five in your worksheet. You may find this information under data synthesis and analysis or a similar subheading under the methods. In our example, note how there is a combination of both methodological and clinical a priori subgroups plan to address potential sources of heterogeneity. Examples of methodological subgroups are comparator and randomization. And examples of clinical subgroups include baseline hemoglobin A1C. Further, this example also includes a priori subgroup analyses for risk of bias assessment. Next, check the description of the methodology used to conduct the SRMA. In your SRMA, did they follow any specific methodology for its conduct? For example, did they indicate if they followed the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions and reported the study in accordance with the PRISMA guidelines? Or, if your SRMA is of observational studies, there is another reporting checklist called the Moose Checklist, which you may find referenced. Also check whether the protocol for the SRMA was registered on a publicly available database. This is an important place for you to check to see whether or not the publication aligns with what was registered as the planned methodology and analysis plan. Sometimes it is not indicated in a paper whether a specific method was followed or whether reporting guidelines were followed. This is just another important consideration for your overall assessment. Make a note in question six of your worksheet on whether your SRMA reported whether they followed any specific methodology. Here's the methodology reported in my example. They followed the Cochrane Handbook and did report according to PRISMA guidelines. They also did register their study protocol. So I can search on clinicaltrials.gov with the identifier noted in the paper to retrieve the registration of this SRME and compare it to the publication. Here's a snapshot of the PRISMA checklist. It's just to give you a sense of what these checklists um, do to try to help with the reporting of um, papers. Many journals actually now require the completion of the PRISMA or similar checklist upon submission of an SRMA for publication. And this is to ensure that all key components of a SRMA are not only conducted, but also reported or at least acknowledged. This is page two of the PRISMA checklist where it continues on aspects for the results to the discussion. Under results, for example, you'll note that it states the reporting is required for the eligibility criteria of the included trials, what the study characteristics were extracted of, the risk if the risk of bias was assessed for each study, and describing sensitivity and subgroup analyses, etc. For the search conduct, recall the three important points to consider when conducting the systematic search to secure a complete and representative sample of all available eligible studies. First, look at your SRMA 
and check to see how many databases was searched. Did they search at least two or more? Were manual searches performed to supplement the database searches? Again, what manual searches means is that for each eligible study obtained from the database search, the reference lists of these articles are searched for other similar studies, which may also be eligible. Typically in the introduction, there will be reference to other similar publications. And in this, this, the discussion, there is usually a section relating the results observed to other similar publications in the literature. Next, check the search terms to ensure that they are reasonable to capture all studies on the topic. Recall in the previous video, my example about the different ways in which yogurt is spelled, not only within a country, but globally. Lastly, were language restrictions placed? Sometimes we come across SRMAs where they only include studies published in English. However, this may unnecessarily be excluding important studies. Here's the section on the search strategy in my example, which indicates three databases were searched along with the manual searches of the reference list of included studies. There's no mention of any language restrictions. Take a minute to find in the text of your SRMA and check whether or not there were more than two databases searched, if manual searches were performed, and record this and any other notes you may have on question seven in your worksheet. To then check the search terms, you will likely need to look into the supplement where the full list of search terms are typically presented. Here's the, first, the full search strategy for my example, which is presented in supplementary table one, and it includes a variety of ways in which fructose containing sugars can be captured, as well as a variety of ways in which the outcomes of interest can be captured. Take a minute to scan over the search terms in your SRMA. Do you feel they appropriately capture the research question? We can also take a look at the figure of the literature search to see how studies were excluded and the reasons. Note in this example, which is presented in figure one in the main article, how none of the reasons are for language. Take a look at the figure of the literature search in your SRMA. This is sometimes called a Prisma flow diagram or a literature search flow diagram. From this figure, we can also see that reports were first reviewed by title and abstract, and then by full text review with eligibility criteria applied. Take a look at how many articles are included in your SRMA. You can find this in the bottom box. In my example, there are three outcomes, hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, and insulin. And within each, the four different study designs based on level of energy control. To simplify things, as mentioned, I will only be looking at the substitution study results for hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C. So for HbA1C, there are 30 substitution trial comparisons. How many trial comparisons or studies are in your SRMA for your outcome? Again, as mentioned, if you have multiple outcomes, just pick one to follow through and assess the results for. So record this in question eight in your worksheet. You can also get a sense of the included studies by taking a look at the table of study characteristics reported in the article. Some studies like the example I have report a summary table, which is presented uh, in the example in table one in the main article. This is usually done when there are multiple outcomes or a lot of studies, and it's not reasonable to include each individual study in the table presented in the main article. So the summary table gives you an overall picture of the different characteristics of the included studies. For example, in this table, I can see that the average median age in the included studies was about 40 years, but the interquartile range or IQR is about 25 to 54, years old, so the included studies provide results across a broad range of adults. 
I can also see that most studies were randomized with an average fast uh, fructose containing sugar dose of 15% of energy with an IQR of nine to 22%. So we'll give a nice spread through which we'll be able to assess dose response analyses. Overall, this information helps to give you an idea of how the conclusions drawn from the included studies can be generalized. The included studies are then usually reported in the supplement. So the supplement will be a bigger table that has each individual study. As a note, one additional aspect I would have liked to have seen reported in this table is population status or health status. Since we're talking about glycemic control here, it would have been of interest to know from this summary how many studies were conducted in populations which had diagnosed diabetes and how many were in other categories like those with metabolic syndrome or if they were generally healthy. However, as we saw earlier in the a priori subgroups, there is a plan for the conduct of subgroups by patient type. So this information will be presented in subgroup analyses. Beside question nine in your worksheet, make a note on the characteristics of the studies included in your SRMA and consider the generalizability of these included studies and whether they relate to the research question. Let's now check the methods to see how the data was collected. Remember, we want to ensure that it is reported and the data is extracted uh, by at least two independent reviewers on both the endpoints of interest and on the data on each of the a priori subgroups. We also want to check to see whether there was an assessment of individual study quality performed. Individual study quality is commonly assessed using the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool or SRMAs of trials. In SRMAs of observational studies, a common tool is the Newcastle Ottawa score. However, there are some other tools out there for individual study quality assessment. So you may want to uh, look to see how your SRMA is reporting uh, or assessing study quality if they are. We will return to this when we have a look at the results. So after you've taken a look through your methods, re record beside question 10 in your worksheet whether your SRMA performed an assessment of individual study quality or risk of bias assessment and make a note of what tool was used. For example, the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool, the Newcastle Ottawa score, etc. The next step is to assess how the meta-analysis was performed and critically assess the results. Before we move on, take a minute to review your confidence in how your SRMA approached the following steps for the systematic review part. Do you feel there was a well-conducted search strategy? A priori subgroups were described well. There was a recognized method that was followed and were at least two independent reviewers conducting the search and extracting the data, including the assessment of individual study quality. We will take a break now and continue in video two with reviewing the steps in the conduct of the meta-analysis and record the information we will need for our grade assessment, which we will do in video three. Thank you for participating.